Good morning, everyone. As you can see, Sharon is not here, so we invite you all to take a seat. Good morning, Mulberry United Methodist Church. Good morning. Glad that you are here to worship the Lord with us today. Hello to those of you at home. A special hello to Ward and Lori and Sharon and others who could not make it today. So glad that you are here. A few announcements today. Uh, unless we have a volunteer from the congregation to play the piano, okay, we will be singing uh, a few hymns, maybe a verse or two without accompaniment. So, but if you are so inclined, just come on down and tickle the ivories here. And we do pray that Sharon will be feeling better real, real soon. On the back of your bulletin, can you believe our annual Thanksgiving dinner is next Sunday? Absolutely. Our church-wide dinner is next Sunday. Thank you so much for signing up to help with the food. Uh, donations will be received at the door for the outreach committee and our wonderful uh, missions that we provide for the church and elsewhere. Hope you can stay next Sunday after church for the wonderful turkey dressing and all the trimmings back in the fellowship hall. Next Saturday at 3 o'clock will be the uh, memorial service for James Ford. Debbie Gollin's son, who has been ill for a long, long time. We hope you can come and support the family. That's at 3 o'clock next Saturday, the memorial service for James Ford. Today is the memorial service in Virginia for his friends and family up there. That's at 4 o'clock today. So prayers for the Ford and Gollin family. In the um, back of the narthex on the glass counter are some sign-up sheets as we prepare, prepare for our church bizarre bizarre will be Saturday, December 7th. There are some sign-up sheets if you could be a door greeter for an hour <coughs> or see Andrea. Also for the bake sale, if you would like to bring something for the bake sale, their sign-up sheet for that as well. Also, we welcome door prizes and silent auction items. So that'll be a great event on Saturday, December 7th from 9 to 2. This Thursday, Church Council 415 back in the Fellowship Hall. All chairmen of committees are urged to attend. Let's prepare our hearts and minds for the worship service today. Pastor? Good morning, Mulberry United Methodist. Good morning. I was told or invited to play the piano today, but I said if I did that, no one would come back. <laughs> so I will be very excited to hear all of your beautiful voices. Because whether or not Sharon is here to play the piano, we are here to worship God. Amen. I invite you all to join me in the opening prayer. Gracious and holy God, we gather here this day in praise and thanksgiving for all the wonderful things you have done for us. Help us to be faithful disciples in all that we think, do, and say, that your great love may be revealed and offer healing to all people. In your holy name, amen. 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 All right, let's stand and try to do this. <laughs> we all know this song. So if you will, just follow. Are you ready? We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one. Oh, praise to the Father from whom all things 
with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that you find security, each of you, in the house of your husband. Then she kissed him, kissed them, and they wept out loud. They said to her, no, we will return to you, your people. But Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way. For I am too old to have a husband, even if I thought there was hope for me. Even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you wait for them to grow old? Would you refrain from marrying? No, my daughters. It has been far more bitter for me than for you because of the hand as the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept again. Or if I kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return like your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not press me to leave you, to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord do thus to me as more as well, even if death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. For some of you, this may be a familiar passage. The book of Ruth is one that people may know. But as I began to think of this text, I thought of Orpah. Was her decision the right one? To go back to the, her family, back to the place she knew. Did Ruth make the right decision? What would her life have looked like if she decided to return to her family? She would not be in the family lineage of Jesus. I began to think and ponder what would Ruth and Orpah's family have looked like? Did Orpah have this loving family to go back to? Did she have a loving community where perhaps she felt safe and loved? We see in Ruth, Naomi urging both of them go back to their mother's house, she said. That's unusual in that time, given that it's usually the father's house. <clears throat> Importance finding the emphasis of finding a husband. If you have a husband, you have more security. The Hebrew word manuka, translated as security in the version we read, implies a sense of rest or being at home. For widowed women in the ancient Near East, finding new husbands was often their best hope at finding that rest and security. Naomi said she was too old to find a husband. Last week, we talked about the widow's offering Widows like Ruth and Naomi were especially vulnerable and they needed support from society to survive. In the book of Ruth, we see Naomi struggle. She felt that God had turned against her. We see the theme of loss, survival. If you continue to read the book of Ruth, you will see that Ruth does a practice of gleaning in the fields. Gleaning was the act of collecting whatever leftover grain or in a vineyard from the harvested fields is a right given to the poor. We see in the book of Deuteronomy, it instructs the landowners to not harvest the olives or the grapes a second time, but to leave what remains for the foreigner, the orphan, and the widows. It was a chance for those who were struggling to perhaps find food. Again, I wondered, was Ruth so determined to stay with Naomi? Was it out of love she had for the family she married into? Was Ruth's home life one of pain and sorrow? Was she willing to go forward no matter what happened? 
These are questions we'll never have the answer to. But they invite us to think about these people in the Bible as humans, as full people with emotions, pain, loss, and sorrow. We reflect on the difficult decisions both Ruth and Orpah made. One to go back to her family, and one to tell Naomi, I will go with you no matter what. I know I can be guilty as looking at the book of Ruth and overlooking those first few verses. The verses of there was a famine in the land, and a certain man from Bethlehem went to live in the country of Moab. A theme in Ruth is the family's migration from Judah to Moab and back to Judah, driven by hunger and famine. The town of Bethlehem means the house of bread. So the house of bread had no bread for them. So they left to go to Moab. If you are familiar with Moab, in that time, and also in the time of Jesus, you would see that Moab was not a place that you would want to go. It was often reviled in the Old Testament. That was not a place the people of God often wanted to go to. But it was out of desperation for food and safety they went. The despair Elimelech and Naomi made to leave their home, to leave the land they knew. The family's migration was out of necess necessity. It re reminds of the hardships they face, reminds the hardship people face. Jesus too brought comfort to those who were in distress. And Jesus had a way of <coughs> challenging those who were comfortable. Jesus challenged those who were comfortable to get outside their comfort zones. He told people to take up your cross and follow me, requiring us to go beyond what is familiar and comfortable to embrace the challenge before us. The sermon title today is, Where Do I Go? And so I was thinking, where do we go as individuals? And where does the church go? The church, like the family in Ruth, is faced with its own challenges today. How do we care for the poor, the widow, the orphan? How do we feel, take care of those who are on the margin? Where are we as a church headed? Many of you know that our church has a long-standing relationship with the RCMA, the Mulberry Community Academy the charter school that opened recently here in Mulberry. They serve right now students K through second grade with plans to expand every year until it becomes a kindergarten through eighth grade school. I began to look a little more into the RCMA and it was founded in 1965 and it was born out of concern for the children working in South Florida's vegetable fields alongside their migrant working parents. Their early founders saw the harsh conditions these children endured, and they took action. They created safe places, including child care centers located in the labor camps, to offer a better future, to offer a place of safety. Today, our CMA operates 54 child care facilities, 19 family child care homes, two charter schools, an aftercare program, and they serve nearly 4,600 children annually across 21 counties in Florida. RCMA exemplifies the values of honesty, respect, self-love, and community care. Recently, the principal, Danny, has been talking with parents and other community members about how the parents are now facing uncertainties. The parents are preparing their children for what life will look like if they are deported, what life will look like if they are displaced, where will the children live, who will be the children's security and safe place. They're trying to instill 
a sense of calm for the children in the midst of uncertainty. The parents are trying to navigate a world where their safety and well-being may be in jeopardy. So I think, how do we as a church respond beyond political affiliations to care for the most vulnerable among us? The outreach team last month got to go to the school to do a project and to bring little pumpkins to the kids. It was a way we could connect to the school. Other ways this church does well with caring for those who were poor and on the margins is through our Monday Food Pantry, which operates for those who need food, no questions asked. And through our thrift store, I encourage you to volunteer in the thrift store, to see at first hand the work that is being done, to offer prices where people can afford things. I also invite each of you to read the book of Ruth with fresh eyes. Through the lens of survival, you see Naomi and Ruth as two women struggling to make it into a world with little security. Later on in the book of Ruth, Ruth ends up working in the field of Boaz, who's connected to Naomi. Boaz offers security to Ruth to say, you will be safe to work in my field. Ruth's decision to stay with Naomi was a courageous one, driven by love and commitment. And through it all, God remained present, guiding them. We heard in the text, Naomi's pain, feeling that the Lord had turned against her. Perhaps you have felt that way in your life. Perhaps you feel alone. Naomi could have made that journey by herself, perhaps stayed in that despair even longer. Perhaps that's why Ruth went with her. She saw the pain on her face and said, I don't want you to do this journey alone. I will be with you. I hope each of you has a person or a community where if you feel alone, you can call them and say, can you just talk to me? Can we have lunch? To remind us that we do not walk this journey alone. Reminded that through this church, we have a community. We have a church family. Ruth's story challenges us to look out for those who might slip through society's safety nets and to find ways to ensure they have a place to call home, a place of security. I believe this church offers a place of comfort and security for those who are perhaps hurting. What are ways we can continue to invite those to feel that comfort, that rest? One way we can do that is inviting your neighbors to the Thanksgiving dinner, letting them know that they can come have a meal here. They can be welcomed. For we as a church must continue to embrace this mission caring for those who are the most vulnerable. Naomi and Ruth found support in each other, and the community of faith can provide support for others today. So church, are we willing to look for those who are hurting? Are we willing to be a place of rest and comfort? I can ask that as a question. Are we willing to be a place of comfort? Yes. yes. Are we willing to look for those who perhaps may feel invisible? Yes. yes. That's not always easy to do, to look beyond. Sometimes when we're at the grocery store, we may be in a rush. We have to get milk for dinner. I invite us in those moments to not be so focused on what we have to do, but to look around us. To those who may need a simple smile, if we see someone have fewer groceries than us, to let them go ahead of us. To smile to the cashier 
and thank them for their job. For those who go out to eat Sunday after church, to say thank you to your server. To be patient as Sunday after church folks come in. <laughs> to be that calm spirit when the world around us seems full of chaos and despair. The world is looking for light and hope. I think we're called to bring that light into the world. Don't you? Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, where do I go? God, sometimes I want to just go home. I want to do what I want. Because sometimes, God, when you call us to take up the cross, it can seem like a heavy burden. When we're tired, when we're hurt, remind us that we do not do this journey alone. Remind us to see those who are hurting, to those who are scared, and let us provide a place of rest. In your holy name, amen. stand uh, with me uh, for the affirmation of faith. The Nicene Creed on page 880 in your red hymnal. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was the incarnate of the Holy Spirit in the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again. In accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord, the giver of life, who precedes us, Father and Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the Lord to come. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. You may be seated. Again, you all sound beautiful. I was expecting you all to break out into how great is our God because you all are doing so good. As we come to this time of offering, we come remembering that the gifts we bring, the gifts we bring, we give to God. We believe that God can take our gifts and use them in ways we can't even imagine. God can use our gifts and multiply them. When we come together, our small gifts, like last week the widow brought her two gifts, her two coins, and those two coins are remembered in history as Jesus looked at her. So I invite you to join me in prayer for our offering and then to invite the ushers forward. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we reflect on Ruth's unwavering loyalty and commitment to Naomi, 
We present our offerings with hearts full of gratitude for the gift of community and faithfulness. May our gifts, like Ruth's decision to follow Naomi, reflect our decision to stand by those in need, and may they be used to build up your kingdom with compassion and love. Use our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness to bring your kingdom of heaven here on earth. In Jesus' name, amen. That's we sang the doxology before. Now we're going to sing the glory of poetry. Beautiful. I did it backwards. I'm sorry. So if you want to stand. Glory be to the Father. Continuing to pray for Ward 
as he is still recovering, to, again, to pray for Lori as a caregiver. As Nancy mentioned earlier in the announcement, to pray for the family of James Ford, the Gollin family. Also want to lift up that on Saturday at 11 will be Ron Sunderhouse's service at Church of God, I believe. Yes. Yes. Um, so to continue to pray for their family. Are there any other joys or concerns we would like to lift up? We're continuing to pray for Lauren. How is she doing? She's doing pr pretty good for her. Beautiful. We'll continue that as a joy that she is doing well. We are celebrating joys of birthdays today. I know we have a birthday in the back. Someone has been letting people know in the door it is her birthday. Again, if you are watching online and you have a joy or a concern, feel free to let the church office know or to give Pastor Samantha a call. I invite you to join me in prayer where we will first begin with a moment of silence where you can lift up any concerns you have or joys or to perhaps just sit and listen to God. Let us pray. Lord, we have a tendency to wander in the wilderness of our own creating. When opportunities to serve you and to make commitments to your service are given, we consult our calendars to see if there is anything else we have to do. Help us to be your hands and feet. Help us to reorder our priorities when sometimes we get in the way. Help us to find wonderful opportunities to serve, to reach out, to help. Let us bring voices of hope to those who are hurting. Heal our wounded souls. Let us lift up those names we shared, those who are recovering, those in the hospital, those who are ill. Lord, we lift up the doctors, the nurses, all of those who work in health care, that they are following their calling of being healers. Let us truly love you with our whole heart, with our whole soul, mind, and strength. Let us remember to find joys at birthday celebrations. Look for the little moments to bring light. Give us your courage and persistence as disciples that your great love and glory, that it may shine through our deeds of loving and kindness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. I would like to invite Phil to come forward to share a bit about the meaning of Holy Communion. Several terms naming the sacrament of Holy Communion are used in past and present Christianity. In this holy mystery, some are used more than others, but all are largely synonymous. The Lord's Supper reminds us that Jesus Christ is the host and that we participate in Christ's invitation. This title suggests the eating of a meal sometimes called the Holy Meal. 
and makes us think of the meals that Jesus ate with various people, both before his death and after his resurrection. The term the Last Supper is not appropriately used for the sacrament, but it does encourage us to remember the supper that Jesus ate with his disciples on the night when he was arrested. The term Holy Communion invites us to focus on the self-giving of Holy God, which makes the sacrament an occasion of grace and on the holiness of our communion with God and one another. Eucharist, from the Greek word thanksgiving, reminds us that the sacrament is thanksgiving to God for the gifts of creation and salvation. The term mass, used by Roman Catholic Church, derives from the Latin word missio, literally meaning sending forth and indicates that this celebration <clears throat> brings the worship service to a close by sending forth the congregation with God's blessing to live as God's people in the world. Okay, now this section, this next section I'm gonna to read to you is very important. <clears throat> the church community has a responsibility to provide ongoing, age-appropriate nurture and education about the sacrament of Holy Communion to all its people. Those who are baptized as infants need continual teaching as they mature in faith. Those who come into membership later in life also need ongoing instruction about the significance of the sacrament in their personal faith journey and in the life of the congregation and larger Christian community. All who seek to live as Christian disciples need formation in sacramental spirituality. Bishops, elders, deacons, pastors, Sunday school teachers, parents, guardians, professors, and others have the responsibility for faithfully teaching, understanding, and practices of Holy Communion. Teaching about the sacraments should emphasize United Methodist positions and practices that should also encourage knowledge and respect for those of other Christian traditions. Thank you. Thank you, Phil, for reminding us of the importance of continually to learn about Holy Communion and to be reminded of this that we are about to receive. I invite you to turn in your hymnals to page 12.
are invited to come forward from the ushers. We're going to take a around. Yeah. <laughs> Our closing hymn has the wrong number. It's 526. What a friend we have in Jesus. We'll just stand and sing the first verse, okay? What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear.